uh, why don't we start with uh, Europe and uh, that continent and saw a, a number of uh, important elections uh, where most of us were hoping that the nationalist candidates would do well. The first uh, cab off the rank was uh, the Netherlands, uh, where uh, we were hoping that uh, Gert Wilders, who is leader of Party for Freedom, uh, his party would uh, improve their, their standing in the parliament. Uh, they, they were currently out of coalition government under the the current Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, they had a net gain of, of five seats. Uh, they still uh, weren't uh, included in the, uh, the next government. Um, so it wasn't the, the big result that we were hoping for. And uh, Gert Wilders, he had really been at the forefront for uh, nearly this entire century, warning about the dangers of uh, Islamic uh, immigration. Uh, but he has had some influence in uh, getting rid of uh, multiculturalism as a policy of the Netherlands, but there's still a lot that needs to be done in that country. And during that uh, campaign, there was still a lot of uh, demonization of him uh, as an ex extremist, as a, a doomsday sayer. Well, this is a load of baloney. Simply, people like Gert Wilders, Nigel Farage, uh, for instance, they have a view of the world that isn't one of utopian multiculturalism, but is one of true egalitarianism, which is meritocracy, which if you have the merits, you have the traits, the education, the talents to come into a country, then you are more than welcome to. If you're not a criminal, you're more than welcome to come into a country. If you're not an Islamic extremist, you're more than welcome to come into the country. These are just basic standards that should have always been uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, and uh, he, he's not some far-right extremist, as they paint him out to be, but he's a man who cares about the sovereignty of his country's borders. And I, I am patently sick of the demonisation of the mainstream left-wing media. To call anyone like Gert Wilders or Nigel Farage or Le, Marine Le Pen, for that matter, anyone who cares about their country's sovereignty, national security, calling them some kind of Nazi, because truth be told, the, the amount of, of shit that they have, uh, that's been, you know, incurred upon them with, with millions of migrants and exorbitant welfare state and the EU socialism, you know, if having a few kind of lone, uh, lone pioneers like uh, Gert Wilders can never be a bad thing in my opinion. Well, let's move on to France, and obviously that was one of the big disappointments of the year. Uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, leader of the National Front, she made it to the second round of the pre presidential election. However, she lost uh, two, two to one to uh, the globalist uh, preferred candidate, Emmanuel Macron. Now, he uh, sold himself as an anti-establishment uh, person because he said, I'm not left or right, but uh, he he was for pretty much business as usual. EU integration, you know, didn't want to address the the immigration cr uh, question at all. So it was a it was a really big disappointment in France that, you know, they elected somebody who is going to make their problems worse. And, and not surprisingly, uh, in the second half of the year, the gloss has quickly worn off Macron. Well, I might get myself into a little bit of trouble here for what I'm going to embark upon, but what what I think is probably this is the case. Marine, Le, uh, sorry, uh, Emmanuel uh, Lecron, Macron, sorry, is secretly um, Angela Merkel's love child, and you know this has been kept quiet for a number of years, and now Macron's been smuggled back into France to basically do anything that uh, Mummy Angela wants uh, him to do. And yeah, personally, he is just, the, in my opinion, is he's the biggest puppet of, of Germany that exists. He's a globalist, he's a Goldman Sachs banker. You know, he, he's not for France. He's, he, he is basically one of the Goldman Sachs establishment types. We have one in Malcolm Turnbull here. America had one in Barack Hussein Obama, and now France has got a Goldman Sachs globalist sellout in Emmanuel Macron. Business as usual, correct. National sovereignty, not a priority. The Islamification of France, um, combating it, not a priority. 
business as usual, integration is a priority. So France is going down the gurgler, sadly. 10% of the country is Muslim. So therefore, there's, there's obviously, there's a lot more friction than there is in a place like Britain that has a population that is 5% Muslim. So a matter of integrating these people, you know, having a merit-based immigration system, having strong national security, and, and having, well, national sovereignty, not being dictated to by Brussels. It, it seems that, um, that France said no to being France, and it said yes. Uh, to being controlled by a bunch of faceless bureaucrats in Brussels when they uh, when they essentially elected Emmanuel Macron. And spare a thought for the, the people of the UK. They experienced three major terrorist attacks this year. There was also one uh, revenge uh, terror attack, and they also had a, a snap election where uh, British Prime Minister Theresa May, she thought she could uh, win a landslide election. It turned out, uh, given her uninspiring uh, campaign, that it was a hung parliament, and she made the unelectable... Uh, we were told unelectable Jeremy Corbyn, uh, he he actually gained seats and now, according to the polls, he's actually in the box seats to be the next Prime Minister of the, the UK at the next next election, whenever that is. If Jeremy Corbyn uh, wins the next general election, uh, me, myself, being a dual national, I will burn my passport because Britain will turn into a socialist hellhole uh, that the likes of Karl Marx and Fidel Castro, you know, would have got rather excited about. You know, he wants to nationalise everything. Well, I, I just read a long and lengthy biography on Ronald Reagan, and he depicted a conversation between uh, the Labor, current Labor le leader at the time, and Winston Churchill. They were both sitting, standing next to each other in the in the urinal, and uh, the you know the, the the they had a conversation, and and the guy looks over at Winston, and he and and Winston he gets a bit nervous, and he says, and the Labor guy says, why are you nervous? Because everything that you see that is large and that works well, you want to nationalise, and that's that's the same thing here with Jeremy Corbyn. Anything that the private enterprise has done brilliantly, beautifully in, uh, the innovation that they've done. He just wants to basically steal it, he wants to loot it, and he wants to give it to the non-productive. And this is what Milton Friedman said, that the problem with this kind of stuff is that we in society at the moment are encouraging the non-productive productive and, you know, um, disincentivizing the productive. And that's essentially what Corbyn wants to do. Corbyn would throw Britain back into the dark ages if he was to become prime minister. He is simply, you know, a socialist hack. Uh, you know, he has supported um, he has supported the IRA, who have basically murdered hundreds of Britons or thousands of Britons in cold blood. He has supported Hezbollah, namely, and he was against Britain, uh, you know, overthrowing the thug-like socialist dictator. Uh, who's, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein. So he's a traitor to the nation. You know, he wants to basically privatise so he can loot it for his Labour cronies, the, the economy. And he would be the worst thing to ever happen to Britain, you know, since uh, Hitler and World War Two. And of course, in uh, Germany, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel got quite the scare at their federal elections with the uh, Nationalist Party, the Alternative for Germany, or the AFD. They gained 12.6% of the uh, party vote, which, me, uh, which made them the third biggest party in the uh, German Bundestag. And uh, Angela Merkel, she thought that she could team up with the other establishment parties to uh, have a fourth term as German Chancellor, but the negotiations, they, they aren't going well. And certainly her grip on power, which she's been Chancellor for 12 years now, has uh, certainly weakened. And it's mainly due to the uh, migration crisis that she's uh, beset the nation with. I, I think personally that there'll be another round of general elections. Um, and that Merkel will probably hang on to power still. But there'll probably be another round of general elections called, and this will be probably a vast period of instability for Germany, as I gather. 
And of course, uh, nationalists saw their biggest gains in the uh, Austrian elections, where we saw uh, their youngest ever chancellor elected, uh, Sebastian Kurz, when the two uh, right-wing uh, right parties, the Austrian People's Party and the Freedom Party, were able to form a, a coalition. Now, despite his youth, uh, Kurz had actually been uh, foreign minister of Austria for three years, where he fought the, the influence of uh, foreign money uh, coming in from Islamic countries uh, to spread uh, radical Islamic ideology, and he uh, taken a stand against uh, the EU's uh, migration policy. And of course, Austria is you know, in the heart of uh, Western Europe, so that was a significant gain for, for the nationalist uh, groups in Europe. It was, and I, I was having yeah, a conversation after the critic with a friend of mine, and we were basically. I, I know that Austria is in the West, but we were basically saying that the 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 old East is the new West, and I think that anything kind of you know east of Germany has some kind of hope still. Uh, Austria, uh, it was great to see them, uh, you know, elect you know a right wing government. Uh, simply, Europe is a mess. I haven't been keeping up with Europe as much as you have. I've been following America and Australia more closely. Um, Europe's kind of flown under my radar a little bit, but but nonetheless, Austria uh, electing a young uh, visionary uh, is a good thing uh, in in this sense because he has a proven track record of performing as foreign minister. He is not. A reality TV star who we don't know, you know, what we're going to get from him, and uh, that in Donald Trump. But Donald Trump has performed. This this guy has a proven track record, which is good. Europe does have some hope. Uh, they do have some people uh, who are willing to actually fight for uh, Western civilization, for all the good things of Bach, Mozart, uh, you know, the the culture, uh, the food, the fine cuisine. All of this has um, been, you know, put on a back seat for, uh, how would I say, a, a doctrine, a religion of multiculturalism that, that has simply ruined Europe. And to have, you know, a few people in here who are who are nationalists and who are not globalists is is, is a marvelous thing, is a great thing. And 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 I think we're seeing some hope. We've seen some hope out of Europe this year. We've we've seen a great deal of disappointment. But the year prior, we saw Brexit. Uh, we've seen Gert Wilders, uh, the um, the alternative uh, party for Deutschland, all gaining some a vast amount of ground. And simply, this shows us that there is hope uh, to combating the faceless bureaucrats in Brussels. And you're certainly right about uh, Eastern Europe. They've turned into Western civilization's greatest defenders. I mean, the Hungarian Prime Minister. Uh, Victor Orban, he built a, a border wall to, to keep out the migrants flooding into Europe and uh, he said he wanted to make the EU pay for it and Poland is seeing a resurgent uh, nationalist movement and uh, unlike uh, governments in Western Europe, they have uh, a government in Poland which actually listens to the people and, you know, implements you know uh, what what they desire, which is you know pleasing that there's you know quite a, a number of countries in uh, Europe who are you know willing to you know stand up to what, what is the ultimate globalist body, which is the European Union. Well, yes, um, the European Union, the uh, UN, uh, the IMF, these are all the globalist bodies that simply are anti. People, you know, they're, they're basically the most pro-establishment bodies that exist. You know, one thing that we've seen is the UN having the right to shoot people as well. So having a global uh, armed army, which is scary. But to to go onto that point of Eastern Europe, I I see Eastern Europe as what the Byzantine Empire was to the Roman Empire. It's just kind of that there's 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 a life support machine that is plugged into nice kind of coal heartlands of Eastern Europe, and it's it's keeping the thing alive. But I think that this is a Byzantine Empire to the Roman Empire. It is just, it, it will be Western civilization for the next few hundred years. And then ultimately, if we don't fight, Western civilization will be overruled by socialist uh, world governmental bodies like the UN and the EU, which is very scary.
This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment, and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.